Just clearing all the uh out of my throat. No. There we go. Good afternoon all, this is Cool Dude Clem and welcome back to Cool Dude Clem's Electronic Workshop. And I think I've got a bit of DC DC converter madness. Welcome to Cool Dude Clem's Electronic Workshop with me, your host, Cool Dude Clem. So I thought I'd do a follow-up video on the DC DC homemade buck boost converter that I designed. Now I've got it working a little better than it was in the previous video. Don't have so much problem with regulation anymore. So this is our input going in. This is our output coming out. And if I twiddle if I twiddle this knob, you can see we can buck. And we can also boost. I'm not going to go any more than about 16 volts because, well, I've only got 16 volt capacitators in there and they're likely to explode if I put too much voltage in. This also is able to keep its voltage output pretty stable across a wide range of input voltages. As I go down, you can see it doesn't shift very much until we get down to about 7 volts and then it falls out of regulation and also my scope is having a little hard time triggering there. So this is about 7 volts and we're getting about 12 volts out, well 12.3 volts out. Let's go up to 16 volts. And you can see it's barely shifted at all. And you might have noticed on the scope it changes its pulse width to keep the output here stable as I change the input voltage. So let's see what happens with a little extra load. Right now I have a 100 ohm resistor connected as a load. So let's connect this fan as an additional load. And as you can see that seems to be working pretty good. Much better than last time. So I'm going to call this uh, pretty much a success, but not something I intend to use. So here we are with the schematic of my buck boost converter. So we have a TL494 producing a square wave with variable duty cycle. And that is sent into this MOSFET here, which energizes this coil. And the voltage that we get out here is dependent on the duty cycle and whatever load is connected. So to regulate that voltage, some of that is sent back into pin 1. And on pin 14, we have a constant 5 volts coming out, which is the reference voltage. And with this potentiometer, I can send some of that reference voltage back into pin 2. And that's how I can control the voltage that we get here. Because the chip compares the voltage between pin 1 and pin 2. And then it does whatever it needs to do to keep the voltage here where I want it. And that's basically, in a nutshell, how this thing works. Now, I was going to add current regulation to it, but... I think I'm going to do that in another video. But enough about that because I have some proper buck boost converters now. And yes, I know this video has been a long time coming, but I had to wait for these to arrive so I could do this video. And that's the trouble when you order things from China. It just takes an eternity to get here. And also, my TV that I fixed went up the spout again. If you remember in that video, I replaced a faulty LED in the backlight with these four LEDs here. Now I knew that these LEDs wouldn't be able to take the full current. So what I did was I put them in this configuration here. So there'd be about six LEDs sharing that 225 odd milliamps. I was hoping those LEDs would be able to take that, but they obviously couldn't. 
So this was the replacement light that I um, that I originally used, and you might be able to see a couple of the LEDs have well gone black inside. So they couldn't quite take the abuse. So here I have those 12 LEDs extracted from the TV, and let's run a little test on these. So let's see what this thing has to say about those LEDs. Testing the good LEDs. Everything is right where we expect it to be. Forward voltage drop of about 2.6 volts, 2.5 milliamps. It even recognizes it as an LED. So we know the good LEDs are putting up the stuff and run. So let's see what this makes of a section with a bad LED. And as you can see, you might be able to see, and this thing says it's a short circuit. That was enough of a change in the voltage drop for the power supply to go, whoa, hold on a minute, something's not right. And just shut off the power to the backlight so I can see what I was doing. I've gone and fixed the TV again, and it is working, although you don't get to see it because as soon as I start my camera recording, it shuts off the output to the TV. So believe me, there was the camera's picture on the TV before I started recording, but as soon as I press the record button on the camera, the camera stops outputting to the TV, which is really, really stupid. So I'll have to try to demonstrate this with a second camera. Which is this one here which doesn't have as good picture quality, it's only standard definition, but there's not much I can do about that. Okay, so, here we go, we've got the camera in standby. The battery Ready. on this other camera is not too good, so I'll have to make this quick. And you can see that the picture from this camera is on the TV, which I fixed again. If I move the camera about, you can see the picture on the TV moves. A little bit of a delay there because there's some processing going on, but you can see it's working. And now, when I start this camera recording, there it goes. And when I stop this recording, the picture comes right back, which is stupid. I mean, it's stupid the way this camera shuts off the picture to the TV when you start recording. I mean, I can still see it in the viewfinder just fine, but... The thing is, having it on the TV makes it so much easier to set up the shot. You can get, you know, you can get the shot right, you can get the lighting right, you can get the focus right, you know, you can get everything right. But of course, you've no idea how that's coming out when it's recording. Anyway, to fix this TV, I got a microwave oven diode, and I used that to bypass that original broken LED. And I put that diode on the outside. That way, if the voltage drop across that diode isn't right, I can take that diode out, and I can easily replace it with another one that hopefully does have the right voltage drop. But fortunately, that first diode that I tried was, you know, just about right. Now, I know those microwave oven diodes aren't exactly known for high current capabilities, but I think they're like 300 milliamps, something like that. So I don't think 225 odd milliamps is going to really be much of a problem. Anyway, back to the main attraction. That's not the only thing I ordered. I ordered some solder, proper solder that is, not that silly lead free stuff. Some crocodile clip cables, because I'm fed up with having to put wires everywhere and twist them around each other to make connections. So that's going to make things a lot easier. Speaking of cables, got some audio cables, because again, I've got hardly any way to connect up my equipment. The only ones I could really get were the ones with a jack plug on one side and the phono plugs on the other side. But, you know, I can splice these cables and make the cable that I want. Although, for most of the things I've got, these cables will be absolutely fine as they are. 
I also got some XLR plugs, both male and female, so I can connect up my DAT recorder properly. Lots of prototyping boards, so there'll be plenty of electronics projects to come. Some HDMI cables, so I can connect my camera to my TV. And I got this little thing here. Supposed to be a full HD capture, but it's actually quite disappointing. Because although it's got the HDMI on one side, it doesn't have the full 1080 resolution. It's only 720 by 576 maximum. But I'm sure I can still find some uses for that. So I got all this from Banggood, and I didn't really cost me much more than about £30, which I guess is about maybe 40 US dollars. So, you know, pretty good deals there. So I'm definitely going to shop there again. Anyway, let's get on with the rest of the video. So what I'm going to do is going to do a few experiments with these. We're going to take a look at some waveforms. See, what I want to do with these is make a kind of a switch mode power supply using these as the actual voltage regulators. So I'm going to take these trimmers out, these 10 turn trimmers, and use potentiometers instead that stick out of the front of the case so I can control the voltage that way. Also, another thing, and I'll probably do that in this video, is I want to reverse engineer these and try to make one myself using off-the-shelf parts, such as a TL494 and other stuff. So anyway, let's get one of these connected up and let's see what it does. So, we've got one of these wired up to this little meter here. So, let's turn on the power and see what it does. Okay, we're getting about 22.9 volts out. So, let's just turn this little trim pot here and see if we can buck as well as boost. Okay, turning it counterclockwise makes the voltage go up. So turning it this way should make the voltage go down. And indeed it does. Okay, we are now bucking. I don't know quite how low we can go because we're kind of at the limit where this little meter stops working, so... Let's go up to about 12 volts. A good all-round 12 volts. Okay, I now have the 100 ohm resistor, which has definitely seen better days. I have that connected across the output. So, let's turn on. Let's see if it stays the same. Yep, I think that was about the same as we had before. Now let's connect up our fan as the additional load. I'm not going to touch that resistor because it's probably baking hot right now, but... Oh, it does actually go down a little bit. I was not expecting that. So, I would say at the moment, this is working pretty much as good as the one that I made. Well, let's have a look at some waveforms. Alright, now we're ready to have a look at some waveforms. Now, I've done a little probing around, and I found the output is on pin 3. And also, we get that on the metal case of the chip, right here. So, let's just zoom in a little bit on the scope so we can see the waveform. Now according to the scope this is oscillating at about 800 kilohertz. I don't know how true that is but let's turn the input voltage up and down and see what happens. Is the waveform getting fatter? I believe so. Let's turn the input voltage up and yeah, I can see the waveform getting thinner. So now let's see what happens when we connect up an extra load. Oh, look at that, it's gone sort of completely square. Well, almost completely square. All 
Right, so I'm going to make this output just a little bit more voltage. Right now it's outputting 12.3. Let's turn this up to about, I don't know, maybe 14 volts. Let's see what happens. Okay, well the um, voltage seems to be getting bigger, but the waveform doesn't seem to be changing shape at all. That's interesting. Let's see what happens if we try to make the voltage low. Oh yeah, I can see the waveform getting thinner as I turn the voltage output down. Right, let's put that back up to about 14 volts. That's about as much as I'm going to run that fan on. So, about 14 volts out. Let's connect up our fan. Yeah, I'd say that's working pretty good. And for those of you who want to get a better view of the waveform, I'm certainly not going to disappoint. So this is what we had before. I'm going to turn that down. I'm going to turn the output voltage down. That is if I can keep my screwdriver in the little slot there. So you can see this is what happens to the wave when we go down in output voltage. And when I increase the output voltage, this is how the wave goes. Let's go back down to about 12 volts. Now I'm going to connect the fan so we have a little bit of additional load. So that is the waveform from one of these Buck Boost DC DC converters. Okay, so. I've done a bit of reverse engineering. I was just probing around with my meter. And alright, I'll stop talking in the funny accent. So anyway, I decided I'd reverse engineer one of these. And I got to about here. And then I realised that, well, these things have inductors in them. And inductors are pretty much a short circuit when it comes to DC. So, probing around with my meter in continuity mode wasn't really going to reveal much. So, I decided I'd look up the chip. And what did I find when I looked up the chip? A schematic of one of these. Unfortunately, none of the component values are listed, but that doesn't really matter. So, I was able to complete my schematic here. And here I've drawn a much neater version of it with a chip represented by this MOSFET and this little control box. So, I intend to build one of these circuits, but using a TL494 and a MOSFET, and of course all the other stuff here. No idea how well it's going to work, but let's have a go. Okay, so I've reconfigured the TL494 as a square wave generator, where I can manually adjust the pulse width, which I will show you by twiddling this knob. As you can see, we can go from a really thin pulse wave to almost a complete square wave. Now, ignore this stuff here that's not actually connected anywhere. I've just left that on there because I will be using it later on. And here is the circuit for those of you interested. Anyway, I think it's about time to add stuff to this. Alright, well, I've built the circuit, or at least I've built it to this point here. So here is our MOSFET, here is our TL494. Um, the only bit I haven't built is all this over here, which is going to come in later on. So, TL494 is still a manually controllable pulse width modulated square wave generator. But let's, let's turn this on and um, let's see if it works. Okay, so we're about to turn on. 
I've also added this little meter here so we can see the voltage coming into the circuit. So, let's see if we get anything. Okay, we got 12 volts coming in and we've got about 3 volts coming out. I hope you can see the meter. I've set up the shot so you should be able to see what the meter says. Alright, I'm going to start increasing the duty cycle. The voltage should increase. Yeah, it certainly is. Let's see if we can get the same voltage out as we're getting in. Alright, let's see if we can... Well, we know we can buck. Let's see if we can boost. This is exciting. Ah oh, yes, look at this. It totally works. Better not go too far up because I don't really want to fry my capacitors or my load resistor. But it totally works. I'm quite impressed with that actually. Because um, I didn't really know how well the coils would work because these are just coils that I wound. I think both of these are about 27 microhenry when I measured them. But yeah, this thing is totally doing its job. We can boost and we can also buck. So, I think the next thing to try is see if we can make this regulated. I think I'm going to have to invest in some beefier load resistors. That was a brand new 100 ohm resistor and you can already see it's taken a bit of a pounding. So, this seems to be shaping up pretty good so far. So I thought I'd draw a schematic so you can see how everything's connected. Now bear in mind that this is still a work in progress, this is not the finished thing. I wasn't sure if this was going to work with, you know, just an N-channel MOSFET, because I don't know if maybe the, there was some other kind of magic voodoo going on in the chip. But what I'm going to do in the next video, because this video is getting rather long, is I'm going to experiment with different operating frequencies and different coils, because Right now, this is probably as inefficient as F, which is not really what you want from any kind of switch mode supply. And also, I'm going to add regulation to that. But that's all going to be in another video, because this video is getting too long, and if your attention span is anything like mine, well, I cannot sit through a video for more than five minutes before I start skipping through. Well, that's it for this episode of Cool Dude Clem's Electronic Workshop. If you like these videos, feel free to give me a big thumbs up, smash that subscribe button for more, and leave a comment if you have one. But as I always say, until next time, goodbye. Why am I even recording this?